All right, chapter 14. Uh, now we have migrated uh, yet to another section uh, of the course and the text. Um, you notice the last section seemed to fly by pretty quickly there with uh, the pathophysiology and pharmacology, although it was uh, very extensive in the amount of material we covered. Um, it was only a few chapters. Well, the same basically is true here for uh, our uh, assessment chapter. And uh, so we just have a, a handful of chapters that we'll cover in this section as well. Uh, we start out with chapter 14, which is general approach to patient assessment and clinical reasoning. Uh, a lot of this stuff will probably be repetitive to what you already know. It's kind of a review stuff. Remember the things that we're finding that people are not doing as well on, on the National Registry at the AEMT level is the EMT level stuff. Uh, they often leave behind the concepts that they learned in EMT school uh, because they're so dedicated to concentrating on, on the advanced stuff. And it's really, truly really the BLS stuff that does save most people's lives. So with that, uh, I remind you that even though it may be repetitive, it's probably something that you need to know by the book again so you're well prepared uh, when it comes down to testing purposes. Um, as always, uh, simply listening and watching the lecture is uh, no replacement to reading and studying your textbook. So if you have not done that, um, either do it before or after you watch this, this lecture. So the advanced EMT education standard that goes along with this says that the AEMT will be able to apply scene information and patient assessment findings, including the scene size up, primary and secondary assessment, the patient history and reassessment to guide their emergency management. Really that in, in a nutshell describes what we do in EMS. So being able to put the puzzle together, and that's one of the questions I used to always ask my potential paramedic students was, uh, if they were coming into the program, they would have an interview with me. And I would ask them, uh, so do you like to do puzzles? A lot of times people look at me really funny. Uh, but then I would say, well, isn't that what EMS really is all about in most cases? Um, it's not the blood and guts and gore. That's the easy stuff. Uh, most of the time, it's the sick person. So that's where we really have to work on putting more together. Or we get the blood and guts trauma patient that can't tell us a single thing and there are no witnesses. So that's really the things that make, uh, make EMS interesting. Uh, there's a couple of multimedia videos here, uh, slide 10, 20, and 43. I'll have videos regarding uh, mechanism and assessment, so you can take advantage of watching those. The objectives for the chapter, not a lot. Only six short objectives for this chapter here. Those are found on page 332 in your textbook. So an introduction, the AEMT must systematically and thoroughly collect relevant information about patient and the situation. Um, and then they have to compare the findings to what healthy functioning looks like. So that's why we spend some time looking at healthy people. That's why we spend time starting IVs on healthy people uh, when we're in class or we do an assessment on a healthy person in class is so we know when we see something that isn't maybe quite right. Uh, it stands out a little more. The, the AEMT has to be able to, to gather these, these pieces of information. And a lot of this skill truly does come with experience, which is something that uh, in this class alone you cannot get nearly enough of. So hopefully over your time as an EMT, you've learned some lessons that you can now apply uh, as an advanced EMT. The, um, I think all of us can probably relate to a time in our past when we went on a call and we hurried up, we threw a patient in the back of the ambulance, we took off down the road, and then realized we'd forgotten a piece of information. Uh, we forgot to gather something. Um, we forgot to go look in the fridge to see if there was insulin. We forgot to go look in the bathroom to see if there was bloody tissues. Uh, uh, we forgot to ask the patient's family members some questions and they're unresponsive. Um, that's, that's one of my uh, one of my favorites when we're testing EMT students uh, or working on skills with EMT students is they'll be okay. We're going to do our assessment. And we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And we're going to load up. And we're going to go. And 
then they'll say, okay, so I'd like to know about the sample history, and I'm like, the patient's unresponsive. Well, I'll ask the family member. Well, you left the family member back at the house. Oh. And it, it, it hopefully helps people at least sometime in their career to go, now wait a minute, I either better slow down or take somebody with me. All right, your think about it goes with your case study on 333. So to look at this picture that we have here, uh, we start to look at the scene. And hopefully our scene size that began from the moment the pager went off, because that's truly when our assessment starts, is when uh, the pager goes off. We're already starting to make some assumptions. We're already starting to prepare ourselves for what we may potentially have to deal with. You know, to, to look at this scene here, uh, we know that uh, this is a, a Land Rover. It's a fairly uh, sturdy made sport utility vehicle here. This woman appears to be trapped in it. Um, that was probably somebody moving, moving right along. So there's probably a, a moderate to high level of energy that was expended in this, uh, this accident. We can see how it crushed right up into the cab there. So what do we expect? Well, probably some lower extremity injuries if she's trapped in the vehicle. They're hooking the lines up to the uh, to the spreaders or the cutters there, so the jaws of life are, are involved here. And it requires some some uh, some extra tools to get this job done. So, and that's not to mention we don't know what else is uh, is going on inside the vehicle. But just from this angle, we can see that there's one person that's been involved. Um, the passengers probably, if there is a passenger, they're probably not much better off. Uh, however, those in the back, if we look at the vehicle. Looks like the back of it's in pretty good shape. So chances are the people in the back are prob probably less injured. So we can see that, uh, well, it looks like at least part of the the ground is wet there. Um, whether or not that came directly from the, the vehicle, it looks like the rest of the vehicle, the rest of the pavement around the vehicle is, is dry, but it's tough to say. So, I mean, we can start to gather clues here. And if you look uh, kind of between the feet of the fireman there, you see that, the vehicle is, is across the center line. Now, granted, most of it is uh, uh, in the travel lane, uh, say, headed towards us from this picture, but uh, we don't know that that's the, where this vehicle came from. Maybe the vehicle was actually headed the other direction and got spun around. So we have to start picking up these pieces of equipment, or these pieces of clues, I should say, pieces of information, and putting two and two together. So assessment-based management. This is maybe something that we're not quite as comfortable with, maybe not quite as familiar with from what we've done in the past. But assessment-based management uh, emphasizes treating the problems found without waiting for a diagnosis to be made. So as we start to pick up bits and pieces of information, we start to act on those things. Uh, if we wait for a formal diagnosis to be made, um, we may not treat the patient at all. Yes, that is an EMS professional, you do diagnose your patient. Um, people will argue that with you and they'll argue that with me and I'll argue with them all day long. Uh, you do an assessment and you do a diagnosis on your patient. If you don't make a diagnosis, however, we don't call it a diagnosis, what we call it is a, an impression, um, a field impression. Uh, if you don't diagnose your patient, then how do you know how to treat them? So we start gathering information, we have to start making some assumptions. Sometimes we're much more reserved in the way that we respond and re react to a person uh, because not only is one sign or symptom specific to anything, so we'll take nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting is a sign and symptom of just about everything. However, there are some things that are fairly specific. So if we say pinpoint pupils and depressed respirations, um, chances are pretty good that we're talking about an opioid or a narcotic overdose um, because we know that that's one of the very few times in which we see those things happen together. So it, some, some decisions are easy and some decisions require much more information. Uh, as an AEMT, you're in a very unique position. You collect this information about the patient's environment and the mechanism of injury because you were there at the scene. We're the only healthcare providers that are there at the site of the emergency. 
occasionally there may be a health a, a home health aide or somebody along those lines or a doctor just so happened to be in the crowd at the basketball game or what have you but we're the ones that are always for every patient that we're involved with have some sort of a connection to the incident um, whereas most patients that come to the doctor's office to the hospital uh, they show up and, and they're now in a sterile environment and, and it, it's hard to understand um, a lot of us are visual learners, but we have to have as many pieces of the puzzle as possible with all the senses in order to make it really truly stand out and make it kind of come to life for us. We're lucky and we can do that. Now, there are some services that have taken a, a different approach with this, and this has kind of changed um, in the, uh, the advent of, of camera phones and whatnot. Uh, and social networking for that matter. Uh, there used to be a lot of services that ran around with Polaroid Instamatic cameras. Uh, and I think most of us probably can remember those as uh, you uh, put the cartridge in this big camera that was fairly good size and you push the button and it popped out a, a printed photo right away. However, you had to wait for it to develop and you had to shake it and you know, whatever. But anyway, so it took somewhere around a minute or so minute two minutes and uh, and the the picture developed and then you could take that and um, present it to the ER and say look here's a picture of what happened uh, here's a picture of the scene uh, so policies have had to change a little bit because now there's so much stuff posted online that a lot of times there's in just there's inappropriate stuff placed online um, so I think cameras have maybe gotten a bad rap in some of these cases. But there are still services who have developed good policies and, and they have a, a camera on the truck, a digital camera on the truck that allows them to take some pictures. Um, sometimes those pictures may be even able to be uploaded into the PCR um, or at least presented to, uh, you know, you take the camera into the, the ER and show the physician, uh, here's, here's what we were dealing with on the scene. So it, it helps paint that picture. However, we still get we get the other sense. We get the smells. And sometimes we, unfortunately, the smell is so bad we get the taste that goes along with it. Um, uh, the sights and the sounds, of, of course, um, of the, the environment that our patient's coming from. Whereas once once they're in the hospital, um, none of that even even gets a second thought in many cases for our patients. Well, there's a video on mechanism of injury. Okay, so the purpose and the goals of our patient assessment. Uh, number one, is it safe? Number two, what is the nature? Number three, how sick is the patient? So it's things that we're looking at immediately. We're going to say, um, is it safe for us to approach this patient and begin care? If not, what can we do about this? Can Do we need to withdraw? Does somebody need to come in and make it safe? Can we make it safe? Can we remove the patient from the issue and then do uh, our further assessment and care of this patient? So what's the nature of the patient's problem? And we really know this by really two major names, mechanism of injury or nature of illness. So when we're looking at that, mechanism of injury, of course, is someone who has been traumatized or they're a trauma patient, they're injured or hurt. And then the, uh, the nature of illness is what is causing them to be sick. So um, those are two major uh, decisions that we make early in this. And sometimes we have to change those. And sometimes they have both. Sometimes they have both a mechanism of injury and a nature of illness. They got sick and crashed their car. So how sick is the patient? We can use all kinds of terms, but really, Let's, let's be realistic. We're really looking at, is, are they sick, are they not sick, or are they about to die? That's really what we're looking for. You know, if they're really sick, great, we'll take them in. If they're about to die, we're probably going to haul them in and make it really quick. Um, if they're not sick, maybe they don't even need to go with us. We also look at which interventions, resources, or actions are required immediately. Is there things that we need to do right now, or are there things that can wait? I tell you what, an IV almost always is something that can wait. 
um, you know, advanced providers maybe don't like to, early in their career, maybe don't want to hear that, but IVs and medications, in most cases, need to wait. Now, I'm not saying wait until we're turning over to the hospital. I'm saying wait till later in the process. Um, things that need to be done now are things like airway maintenance, breathing for the patient, pushing on the chest, defibrillation, bleeding control, maybe an epinephrine or some oxygen. Um, those sorts of things do come fairly quickly. But the nitroglycerins and the and maybe even the Narcans um, and, and the D50s, those need to wait till we maybe gather a couple bit a couple pieces of information before we start heading down that route. Yes, they they can have some very dramatic results and they can uh, truly uh, make a difference in a patient's life. But remember, if it's a medication or any other treatment, it has the potential for it to be harmful. So, which healthcare facilities can best meet the patient's immediate needs? This depends all on the setting that you work in. If you work in the metro area, where you have your choice of, well, say here in the Omaha metro area, you have your choice of nearly about 10 different hospitals to go to, um, that may, may drive your transport decisions a little more. Whereas if you're working, we'll say in, oh, we'll, we'll say uh, Crawford County, Iowa. Um, Crawford County, Iowa has one hospital in that county. Now granted, there's a few around the, the edges of the county. Um, Maybe we're, we're you know, talking somewhere in that that uh, rectangle of the Sioux City to Omaha to Des Moines to, uh, what is that, Mason City up there. Um, you know, there's, there's not a lot as, as far as tertiary facilities in there. Yes, uh, Mary Greeley and Ames is, is a little bit bigger facility, and Trinity and Fort Dodge may be a little bit bigger facility, but for the most part, a lot of those are critical access hospitals that uh, St. Anthony's is another one, I guess, and Carroll has a little bit more. But uh, most of those hospitals, uh, they don't have cardiac cath labs. They're not going to crack your chest uh, and uh, give you a heart bypass right there in their, uh, in their facility. They're going to end up going elsewhere. So it's going to depend on what, truly, what system you work in. And people need to frequently reevaluate their system and say, is, what can we do? What can we do differently? You know, some places are lucky. We'll take, for example, uh, down in the Clorinda, Iowa area. Clorinda's fairly remote when it comes to um, larger cities. Uh, it's a good hour or more away from most of the larger cities. But uh, reevaluations of the system down there eventually determine, hey, maybe they could benefit from having a helicopter. No, they don't. That helicopter doesn't sit on a major trauma center. Um, but it's positioned appropriately that it can expedite transport to a trauma center. So again, re constant reevaluation of your system and knowing how your system works. You know, maybe even if you have your choice between one or two or, or not one, two or three or maybe even four critical access hospitals to transport to. And when I say critical access hospitals, I'm talking hospitals that have 25 or fewer beds that are given a better uh, a better cut of Medicare funding in order to stay open so people in rural communities have access to health care. Um, but uh, these smaller critical access hospitals, if you get your choice between several of them, maybe you know that, hey, I know that this hospital has somebody staffing the ER 24 hours a day where that critical access hospital maybe only has somebody on call. And we can be to that, you know, it, it takes us a minute longer or two minutes longer to get to the one that has somebody standing there ready to go. That may sway your, your opinion. Or maybe you say, uh, well, this hospital is closer to the trauma center, so it's going to be a shorter ride in the long run for them, as opposed to saying, well, we're only taking you to this hospital. That's it, period. So knowing what facility can meet their needs. Um, uh, another one, how should the patient be transported? Well, everybody instantly believes, well, we need to call a helicopter. Um, I, I disagree. Uh, helicopters save out-of-hospital time. So uh, I, I think I've gone, gone down this route before, but when I was uh, working in Crawford County, Iowa, uh, it would take either an hour by ground ambulance to get the patient to the hospital uh, in Omaha, 
where it would take an hour by air ambulance to get the patient to the hospital in Omaha. The difference is the out of hospital time. Um, so it would take roughly five minutes to get the helicopter fired up, 15 to 20 to fly up there, 15 to 20 on the ground, 15 to 20 to fly back. Well, that's the same amount of time as it would have taken if we just put the patient in the ambulance and went. However, they were away from a doctor's care, uh, away from the resources of a hospital uh, for much less time in a helicopter. So that's really where the difference is. It's not that the helicopter has that much more training. Usually they do have a little bit more uh, education, a little bit more specialty education. Um, not that they have a lot more cool toys. In fact, they probably have fewer toys in many cases because they just don't have the room. Um, you, know, you gotta weigh things like, is this patient truly need to go by, by air via ground? Knowing that the cost is gonna be 20 times that of going by ground, you have to really look at it and not just say, well, I need to get back to work, so we're going to fly this person. Um, that's not the way the system is supposed to work. So how should the patient be transported? Do all patients have to even go in an ambulance? No. Sometimes they just didn't know what else to do. And you get there and you reassure them of the situation. They're like, well, can I just take them in the car? If your system allows that, you may be able to, to do that. So what do you need to do to support the patient's vital functions from the time you arrive on the scene to the time you transfer the patient care to other personnel? So what is it going to take? What do we need? What sort of resources? What sort of training? Um, and do you have it? Or can you get it? Can you now tier, for, tier with a paramedic level service? Or maybe you're going to be on the other end of that because you're going to now be the only advanced service in your county and the other BLS services said, hey, we know the AEMTs have a couple of drugs. Maybe they can do something. So you very well could be called to uh, to be in a tiered system uh, to uh, to meet up with another service and provide a higher level of care. And then is the patient's condition stable, improving, improving or worsening? Well, hopefully they're at least staying stable and once in a while even improving for us. But unfortunately, from time to time, they just continue to get worse. And, and we don't have a lot of, in many cases, a lot we can do about that. So a, a different thing about it here, you and your partner are the second unit on, to arrive on, a, on scene for a multi-vehicle, multi-patient collision. After receiving a quick report from the triage officer, you begin to assess a child who is entrapped. And that child's mother is outside the vehicle screaming for you to hurry. Well, does this instantly put us into a bad situation? It does. It does. Because we're, we're giving, uh, we're getting extra outside feedback that is perhaps going to sway what we do and uh, perhaps make us make rash decisions when really maybe this patient didn't need quite what we did. So what do you keep in mind as you uh, begin your assessment. Remember that a lot of times when we're dealing with parents and children that the parents can actually make the situation worse. So if we have this person who's outside, who is screaming and hollering at us, they're going to make the patient more of an emotional wreck and perhaps make the, the whole process um, painful for all of us. And so maybe it's somebody we need to ask to step away. Maybe we need to have somebody Go and talk to that mother and say, look, all you're doing right now is upsetting your child. We're doing everything we can. Step back, be quiet, and we'll take care of your child. But with you in here screaming, you're making the situation worse, um, and we can't appropriately assess the care for your child. <clears throat> so our general approach to the patient assessment is a systematic approach that minimizes the chances that you'll overlook an important clues in the patient's problem. Um, and you're going to use preliminary information that you generally gain from dispatch and from walking up on the scene to obtain, uh, that we obtain to direct the rest of our assessment. Because we could potentially have to assess every patient for every medical problem in the world. However, if we don't, if we pick up on key elements, it helps us narrow down or do what we call differential diagnosis 
very quickly. I can't emphasize enough paying attention to the word systematic uh, because when we're talking about a systematic approach, if we do it the same way every time, it makes things much easier. Um, if we develop our own system, it may not perfectly match the order as we would uh, on a testing sheet. Uh, however, remembering that we got to do the primary assessment pretty much the way that it, it's listed on the sheet. Um, other, other than that, secondary assessment, we have a lot of variability to. So, but doing that system, checking the A's, then the B's, then the C's, then the D's, and the E's, uh, helps us just develop a pattern so it becomes second nature. Uh, this is something that I noticed in, in uh, both paramedic students and other advanced CMT students is a lot of times they want to skim through it and jump through it like they would um, more or less in a real life field setting. And people will whine, bitch, moan, and complain. Well, you know, here in the classroom is nothing like real life. No, it actually is. It teaches us the basics that we then apply in the field. And it's not that we don't do them. It's some of them become second nature. Some of them become automatic. And that's a good thing. However, we've got to remember for education purposes, you've got to make sure that you're able to see each element, each component. And that's why we have to be a little bit more by the book. All right, so efficiency is critical in patient assessment. If we're not able to move along through patient assessment quickly, some of our patients will have a very negative outcome. Um, if we're not able to quickly pick up on some of these key elements, we may spend the entire time thinking about something uh, and never actually making any actions. So um, being efficient, picking it up and processing it and bouncing it off your coworkers uh, and saying, OK, where do we think we're going with this makes things move much quicker. There's so many different medical data points that could be collected in the field, but it would steal valuable time from for patient survival. So when we're talking EMS, we're talking two or three or four hands uh, that are able to do a few things, get them stabilized, and then transported, treated, and transported to the hospital, where then there's a whole bunch more resources that can then be used to uh, gather more data. However, we're so limited why a lot of times some of those key elements get left out. So as you develop your assessment skills, you're going to learn to direct your assessment based on your patient's presenting symptoms. And sometimes we get enough information directly from those patient symptoms that uh, we can pretty quickly come to a, an impression, a field impression. Um, other times, though, uh, we just have to keep on digging until we finally get enough information uh, to, uh, that will finally make us have that aha moment. All right, so what are the four essential components to patient assessment? I'm going to stop here for just a moment because some of you guys are old, old school EMTs or were EMTAs or EMTBs. Um, some of you guys may be new school EMTs. Uh, where you actually started out your your very first licensure after 1995 was an EMTB license. Um, there's some terminology that has changed over time. Um, the scene size up hasn't always been so clear, hasn't always been so obvious. Um, in the olden days, prior to 1995, it, it really was more or less part of the primary assessment. And then the new school EMTBs, so from 95 really to about 2010 or so, uh, learned about the initial assessment. And the initial assessment is really the same thing as the primary assessment. It's to find and treat the life threats. It takes all of about 60 seconds to do. It's checking your ABCDs and doing the really, really critical interventions that are going to help preserve some of those things. So the correct name for it is the primary assessment. 
initial assessment is the old dated term. Then we have the secondary assessment. Well, the secondary assessment um, in the 95 to about 2010 area uh, got split up and called the focused history and the focused assessment and the detailed physical exam. Um, so those terms were what the secondary assessment is now and what it used to be. So the secondary assessment is everything we do beyond that that uh, first 60 seconds of finding and treating the life threats. So it's it's the head to toe. It's the asking you the the sample history, the OPQRST, gathering vital signs if we didn't get those through the primary assessment. And then the other treatments that we do and the preparation for transport happens in the secondary. And then finally the reassessment. Uh, reassessment for a while was called ongoing assessment. Um, and um, but reassessment is basically going back, reviewing what we've already done, looking at it and saying, has anything changed and is there anything that we need to do to accommodate said change? So here's the uh, here's another video uh, on assessment. So <clears throat> the scene size up. The scene size up is used for you to identify the hazards, the number of patients, the need for additional resources, and determine the nature of illness or the mechanism of injury. Um, so it, it's really kind of looking at the incident from face value and saying, what can I gather, what can I glean from what is right here in front of me, um, and what can I start to make some decisions on? Because really, if we didn't do some of these things in the scene size up, we may never pick them up or we may never do them. It's like BSI is part of this, or body substance isolation, or PPE, or whatever you want to call it. If you don't put it on before you put the hand on the patient, there's a good chance you're never going to put it on. So that's part of scene size up. We're looking at the number of patients, looking at the potential number of patients. So let's say you roll up on a car crash. Uh, it's a rollover accident, and one of the very first things that you see as you come out of your ambulance as you walk towards the car is a, a car seat. Uh, laying on the roadway. It's empty and then you get to the car and there's one lady in the car, the driver. You should probably at that moment say, is there potentially another patient here or more? Maybe there. Maybe she had three kids in the car and only one of them was car seat size. So you need to be paying attention, you need to be looking around, you need to have people looking for you and hopefully the patient is with it enough that they can tell you, no, I was alone in the vehicle, there's no one else with me. So that's that's the sort of thing you, you kind of have to be paying attention to. Um, is there a need for additional resources? Most ambulance services, EMS services, are not the extrication service. They do not do the cutting and the spreading with the, the big tools, um, with the hydraulics and whatnot. So you may need to make a separate request for that. So if you have a, a fire department that responds with you, you may have to uh, request them separately. Um, they're not always a dual response. They're not always an automatic uh, uh, alarm. Do we need to get utility company coming? Or do we need to look at uh, having the gas shut off? Or do we have an elect downed electrical wire? Maybe we truly do need fire. Maybe it's a separate system uh, altogether uh, that uh, uh, they don't send a fire truck. Now people are saying, no, well, you just told us rescue. There are places in which rescue and fire operate basically together, yet in an independent uh, system. So you would think that they would automatically send those, but they may not. Do you need to call for paramedics? Do you need to call for a helicopter? Um, you have to look at uh, what is it that you maybe can't provide on this scene. Do we need additional ambulances? You show up and it's a school bus crash. Let me tell you what, most school bus crashes, one ambulance is not going to handle it. Now, if it was empty and it was the driver returning to the barn, okay. But uh, if you've got 50 hurt kids, yeah, one ambulance ain't going to cut it. 
So and then we also determine the nature of illness or the mechanism of injury the best we can. Sometimes it's a matter of um, standing back, looking at the scene. Sometimes it's a matter of doing some snooping, looking around, asking a bunch of questions. Not always apparent. Sometimes it changes. Sometimes it's both. So here's kind of our flow chart. You can find this on page 335 in your text. Kind of our flow chart of how we proceed through assessment. Um, and uh, you know we're going to talk more about these these individual parts and pieces uh, as we proceed through the next couple of chapters. But uh, so this kind of gives us the idea of those components in that patient assessment process. So MOI, NOI, mechanism of injury, nature of illness. Uh, we determine whether that patient's problem is due to an injury or a medical problem. And hopefully we can put a few more details on that. And one of the last parts that we deal with in the scene size up um, is the general impression. Now that general impression is kind of your gut feeling about the situation. How urgent is this? How life-threatening is this? You know, we're looking at all those things such as what did we gather from our 60-second uh, or what are we gathering um, from before we even get to our primary assessment? Are they responsive? Are they unresponsive? Are they wailing in pain? Do they appear to be in a lot of distress? Or are they kind of just taking it easy? Now we get these people who complain of, oh yeah, I've got this terrible, terrible pain, yet they sit there on their phone all day long. And, oh, it's, it's, it's an 11 out of 10 pain. It's the worst ever. You know, yet they're sitting there joking with their friends and they're having a, a, a great time. And it, it's hard to believe those people. Um, and so sometimes it's, well, we know what we've been given, but when we actually do a gut check on it, we're like, let's just be conservative and let's be uh, err on the side of caution here. All right. So during the primary assessment, we are then going to confirm the level of responsiveness and check and for and correct immediate life-threatening problems that involve ABCs. I also include D's in there. Um, I, I think D's belongs there as well. And uh, D is disability and dysfunction. So our primary assessment, we're confirming level of responsiveness. So if they didn't look up at us immediately when we walked into the scene, uh, we may have to go over and try to wake them say something to them, try to get their attention, or provide a little uh, painful stimulus in order to get their attention. And then we're going to look for and correct those immediate threats to life, the A's, the B's, the C's, and then they do also have the D here, so D for disability and dysfunction. Uh, disability and dysfunction tells you a lot about uh, the brain, so it tells you what's going on upstairs. So responsiveness, pupils kind of goes in there as well. So, and establishes our priorities for patient care and transport. So if we don't have anything jumping off the page at us by the time we get through our primary assessment, in many cases, we do not need to do screaming lights and sirens all the way down the road until we uh, uh, you know, almost get into 14 accidents on the way to the hospital. If we didn't find it in the primary assessment, chances are pretty good this patient's going to be fairly stable and should be a nice, easy ride to the hospital. So what does ABCD stand for? D is disability. And that's told to us via level of responsiveness. It's the ability to respond to the environment, their mental status. We generally will use ABPU as our mnemonic to help us assess level of responsiveness. Avpu remembers airway, oh, airway, sorry, alert, verbal, painful, and unresponsive. We don't have semi-conscious. We don't have partially non-responsive. Um, there are there are four levels of consciousness. They're either alert. They're responding to us when we give them a verbal prompt. They're responding to us when we give them a painful stimulus or they are completely unresponsive. The other part of this is their orientation. So there's alertness and there's orientation, or there's level of consciousness and there's orientation. Now that's where people sometimes get um, 
uh, get off track is they substitute orientation for their level of consciousness. So you can be one of four levels of consciousness, alert, verbal, painful, or unresponsive. However, your orientation can be all over the map. You can have people who you know, know can answer every question, and you have people who can't give you an answer to a single question. They just look at you with a blank stare. So our ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, these are immediate threats to life, of course. Uh, some, we don't do something about these. Uh, they're going to go downhill very quickly. The absence of breathing circulation is our highest priority in the unresponsive patient. If we don't have breathing, we don't have circulation, the rest of it's not really going to matter. Of course, you have to have an airway. If you don't have an open airway, even the Bs and the Cs don't matter. So an obstructed airway or an inadequate breathing has to be managed immediately, as does lack of pulse. So those sorts of things really start to uh, grab our resources and our attention uh, and uh, can be very they, they can be very uh, very good at stealing our attention. They definitely steal our resources. They can steal our attention and keep us from asking some of these other questions to try to get some more uh, answers as to what's going on here. So why is this person not breathing? And then later on you note that they have pinpoint pupils. And oh, well look at that. They also have uh, track marks in their arm. Oh, I wonder if they overdosed on heroin. Uh, so hopefully we can keep our wits about us enough that somebody can continue to ask questions while we're, we're working. So assessing that circulation, we're looking to look at that overall quality of the patient's perfusion. If they are pulseless and meet the criteria to resuscitate, we're going to start CPR. We're going to start using a CAB mnemonic uh, versus the standard ABC mnemonic for the responsive patient. If patient's responsive, we do airway breathing circulation. If they're unresponsive, we use CAB circulation, airway breathing, uh, where we're going to start pushing on the chest. We're going to get the AED out. Um, and uh, and proceed down that way. We also need to make sure we control any ongoing hemorrhage, any severe hemorrhage. Uncontrolled hemorrhage leads to shock and death. They bleed out their, their circulating blood volume. Uh, you have nothing to push around in their chest. So it's something we have to um, pay close attention to and making sure that, uh, yeah, if, if we, we do everything to maintain ABCs really well, but we yet still allow them to bleed and bleed and bleed, uh, we can have a, uh, a, dry, a pretty dry patient uh, uh, real quickly. So, so our primary assessment establishes priorities for treatment and transport. It finds and treats life threats. And then it gets us headed down the correct road there. So we need to talk about who are some critical patients. So critical patients, uh, those who need or are on the verge of needing emergent interventions. So a cardiac arrest with uh, <laughs> cardiac arrest with difficulty breathing. Well, generally cardiac arrest uh, doesn't really have difficulty breathing. They're just not breathing at all. They have cardiac arrest. They have difficulty breathing. They have cardiac-related chest pain. They have signs or symptoms of a stroke where they have a significant mechanism of injury. So significant mechanism of injury. That could be things such as you know, high-speed car crashes, falls from greater than three times their own height, um, a, uh, a high-energy uh, missile wound, so you know, a high-powered rifle. Um, those sorts of things would be significant mechanisms of injury. Non-critical patients would include things uh, evaluated, treated at a hospital. Uh, they don't really require immediate interventions. So they don't have immediate concerns of airway breathing or circulation. Their mental status is alert oriented, uh, or at least oriented for themselves. Uh, once in a while we get this, uh, uh, we get called for a patient with dementia who has an altered mental status. Well, how do you know? How are they normally? Uh, well, they're, you know, Compared to to you and I, they they don't function at the same level. But this you know normal for them is they know their name, but they don't know 
their place. They don't know their date and time. So um, once in a while you can get this call. The patient is more alert and oriented than normal. Okay, well, tell me about this. Um, and they have no life-threatening medical condition or mechanism. All right, so components of the patient assessment process. For critical trauma patients, a rapid trauma exam is performed before packaging and transporting the patient. But a detailed head-to-toe is deferred until you are not to the hospital. So when we say that, we're starting down the secondary assessment. And that secondary assessment is saying we're going to obtain a brief medical history, we're going to get some baseline vital signs, we're going to do a physical exam. Now that may include the rapid physical exam of the medical and trauma patient where we very quickly will just hit each one of the major body areas. So the head, the neck, the torso, the proximal extremities for life-threatening uh, conditions not found in the primary assessment. Generally, if it's beyond the knee or beyond the elbow, it's probably not going to be an immediate life threat. From that, we then can head down the route of a focused physical exam where we then start to use those patients' complaints, primarily chief complaint, to, to guide where we look, what we look for, and the questions that we need to make sure and ask on our history. Sample and OPQRST are great pieces of, of information, but they're not all there is to it. Um, sample and OPQRST don't tell you how many times this pregnant woman has been pregnant. It doesn't tell you how quickly her last labor was. It doesn't tell you how many kids she's lost. So we have to continue to gather more information beyond the sample OPQRST. Those are the, the, the basic skeleton. We have to go in and we have to add the extras. Obtain a baseline vital signs. If we did not get a full set of vital signs during the initial assessment or the primary assessment, my bad, we didn't get that during the primary assessment, uh, we need to make sure that we get full set of vital signs. A lot of times things happen simultaneously. Somebody's doing ABCs while somebody's getting vital signs and somebody else is putting on oxygen. Uh, we're going to focus physical exam relevant to pa the patient's condition. So sometimes we gather lots of information and none of it has anything to do with what's actually going on with the patient. So we have to continue to use the information that we've gathered on the patient and pick out what's critical for us to know and what's less critical for us. So for that unresponsive medical patient, perform a rapid physical exam to detect any serious problems not found in the primary assessment. And then the secondary assessment of a trauma patient depends on their severity. Why they throw this back in here, I don't know. But the mnemonic airway breathing circulation disability and E, expose, expose and examine. So uh, we have to throw that E on the end of there. Um, to remind us to expose and examine because we can't treat, we can't fix what we can't see. So in our reassessment, our ongoing assessment uh, is going to continue to make observations about the patient while preparing for transport and initiating treatment. So we maybe have started some things, we need to go back and check them. So critical patients, it's every five minutes or sooner non-critical patients every 15, stable versus unstable. Uh, sometimes we started them out on a non-rebreather of 15 liters, and here we are 25 minutes later, they're still on 15 liters on a non-rebreather on our portable bottle that's now empty. Or we started that IV and we gave them, we were intending to give them a 300 cc fluid bolus, yet we forgot to go back and turn it off. And so now they've gotten 800 cc's of fluid. Um, or we put on that bandage and that dressing to control the bleeding um, and we go back to check on it and it's bled through. These are the sorts of things that reassessment find. Or we gave them that EpiPen and now they're not as short a breath as they were before. So these are the key pieces of information that lets us know how are we doing. So what are the four major components of the patient assessment again? Scene size up, 
primary assessment, secondary assessment, reassessment. So now we step into the next section here of the chapter where it talks about clinical reasoning and problem solving. So when we're using clinical reasoning and problem solving, uh, these are the sorts of things that uh, really helps, helps to set us apart from, uh, say, emergency medical responders, uh, where a lot, of, a lot of things that EMRs do are really kind of if this, do this driven. And a lot of things in EMS over the history of EMS have really been very cookbooky, been very if this, do this. Well, clinical reasoning and problem solving helps us make smart choices and smart decisions in the way that we treat and assess our patients. So we can start with some knowledge of the base facts and principles, which is what we're doing here in class. We can also learn the processes of problem solving, which we start to touch on here in class, which you're probably also going to gather more information um, as you go to continuing ed classes and whatnot. And then between them, we have the patient assessment experience. So we're collecting, we're analyzing, we're forming impressions, we're managing patients. And those things themselves are driven off of our knowledge base and our learned processes. But then what we learn in the process of patient contacts sometimes then goes back and we make adjustments to our base knowledge. We make adjustments to our learned processes. So I think lots of us probably can think of times in which we maybe made an error or maybe just overlooked something in our patient assessment and we've adjusted the way we do our patient's assessment ever since. Or we've adjusted the way that we give our injections or we start IVs or we put splints on or the way we talk to our patients or whatever. Uh, that's, part of, that's part of the whole clinical reasoning process is, is constantly evolving. So readiness for problem solving, uh, it requires a knowledge uh, base of the different sciences, our science of, of healthcare and of EMS. So that readiness for us includes gathering these bits and pieces, which sometimes people say, well, this has absolutely nothing to do with anything I'm doing in the field. Sure it does. Yes, it may be not quite as black and white in the field, but it helps us. It's that whole... I'll never use algebra. Well, you've learned now you will use algebra, uh, but algebra teaches us a lot more than just about numbers. It teaches us about problem solving. How do we troubleshoot this? And then we have some hypothetical deductive approach. So this is a problem solving that's structured, it's formal, and it's deliberate. So basically what we're talking about here um, is we're starting to approach this weigh the possibilities of what could it potentially be and what it could potentially not be. We look at advantages and, and disadvantages. Um, so it, it's a sorting process. It's saying, well, if it was this, we probably would see this. So chances are good that maybe it's not that. Uh, we're not going to absolutely positively throw it out yet, but the systematic process, we pick up these these different concepts, we pick up the different signs and symptoms, we start to maybe develop what's called, what we refer to as a hypothesis, and the hypothesis is our theory really, and our theory basically says, okay, well, how can we prove or disprove that hypothesis? So if it was this, it almost always would have this. You know, if, if we were looking for six or eight signs or symptoms, and the patient only has one, it, it makes it pretty unlikely that that's really what we thought it was going to be. So we then continue down the line and say, well, what do we know that has those signs or symptoms? Okay, well, we come up with a new hypothesis. And we say, okay, how can we prove or disprove this? So it's a narrowing down process. It's a funnel. I like to think of it as, as a big funnel. Um, when we get called out on a call, that patient could have anything in the world wrong with them. And then as we gather information, we're told the patient passed out, or the patient has shortness of breath, or the, the patient is bleeding, or the patient was involved in a, in a motor vehicle collision. 
uh, we can start crossing things off. Well, it's probably not that, probably not that, probably not that. Now, when we cross them off, we're just putting a line through them saying probably not. Um, we're not scribbling them out completely with a big black magic marker or whiteout because we may actually come back to that again and say, well, it was that. Uh, it, we need to bring that back into our possibilities. So that differential diagnosis, this is narrowing it down to our potential high probabilities. And then we'll have that clinical impression or our field impression, which tells us this is what we strongly believe it is. <clears throat> so some questions that should guide your patient assessment process. And you can find these on four, I'm sorry, 343 in your textbook. Um, number one, is it safe to approach the patient, begin care uh, in the patient's current location? If not, what do we need to do to solve this? These are, these, remember, these are kind of a repeat from what we saw earlier. Uh, what is the nature of the patient's problem? How sick are they? What interventions, resources, or actions are required immediately? Which healthcare facility can be best, best meet this patient's need? What's the best way to transport them there? What do we uh, need to do to support the patient during that time? And then is that patient's condition stable, improving, or worsening? So we constantly come back to those same questions. So we, here we have another video on uh, the initial assessment. So some things that we're going to use um, in making some of our decisions. Number one, pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is huge. We use this in EMS all the time by saying, uh, well, if the patient is complaining of, of, uh, of being maybe uh, anxious and they're pale, they're cool, they're diaphoretic, they're nauseated, um, they may be a little lightheaded. Most of us can say, huh, pale, cool, clammy skin, altered mental status, including some anxiety, um, nausea, vomiting. Boy, that sounds like shock. Well, that can, that leads us down that road. It leads us to say, oh, it sounds like the patient's kind of shocky. Let's keep digging. Whereas if we said, you know, they're pale, cool, clammy, um, lightheaded, a little anxious, uh, nausea, vomiting. Uh, chances are probably pretty good that uh, it's not a patient with fluid overload. Uh, it could be, but uh, uh, more likely than not, they're they're lower on fluid than they are on high, high on fluid. So, so we use that pattern recognition. We start looking at all these signs and symptoms we learn from chapter to chapter to chapter say, okay, what does this match up as closely to? So when we don't have experience, sometimes it makes it much more difficult. So as we start to see more and more patients with more and more signs and symptoms, uh, we start to implant those, those bits and pieces of information in our mind. Um, remember that uh, the usefulness of pattern recognition is developed with the experience over time. So sometimes we, we real quickly jump to a conclusion when we didn't stop to consider the other potentials and possibilities. So once in a while, we can get premature diagnostic closure, meaning that we, we jump to that conclusion. We got tunnel visioned is what they're saying here. Don't get tunnel visioned. Um, and we get there, and all of a sudden now we don't have the, we don't have the, the support to back up which way we went because we didn't ask all the questions. We didn't look at all the things. Another approach we use is heuristics or the rule of thumb. Um, so uh, an example of heuristics often used in medicine when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. Now, simply put, that means most common cause is the horse. However, we don't want to completely exclude other potential causes. So if we have that patient that's pale, cool, clammy, nausea, vomiting, anxious, um, we should probably be thinking, oh, this patient's shocky. Now, is, there, is there the potential for other things to be there? Sure. But when we start to, uh, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Um, there's another you know, cute little saying that we use it and basically means heuristics. Um, you know, we use these a lot to guide us down a certain path. Hopefully, we're smart enough to go, okay, well, how could I prove that it wasn't? We don't only need to prove that it is, but sometimes we need to prove that it, that it isn't or what it could potentially not be. 
So sometimes we use things like pertinent negatives. So we'll ask the patient, well, do you have, uh, are, do you have any complaint of, of pain here? No, no, I have no pain there. Um, where if the patient really truly had that disease, in most cases, they would have that pain. Well, we list that as a pertinent negative. Say, no, nope, patient does not have any pain. Um, we could easily just leave it out because, no, the patient didn't complain any pain. Why should I, I chart it? But it's helping you build your case. It's helping you, helping you to support your own medicine. So we often also run into pitfalls in our clinical reasoning. So some of those pitfalls uh, include, include search satisficing. So imagine you're shopping for a gift for a family member. You're pressed for time and a few dollars. Uh, variation of prices is, is uh, not a concern for you. The mall is crowded, traffic's a mess. And if you're like most people, you'll attempt to settle for the first satisfactory item, uh, even if it's not perfect. So basically this is saying, well, it, it's close. It's close enough. Basically that's what it is, is saying close enough. Uh, whereas if we started, if we kept asking questions and we kept looking, um, it probably will back us up. But uh, it could also help us, uh, or, or you know, the search satisficing could also make us stop short and uh, we miss something and the patient has a, a critical outcome. We also have the fundamental attribution error. And that fundamental attribution error, uh, basically, we walk into an emergency department, we encounter a visitor arguing with staff, your assumption that uh, it might be that the visitor is a troublemaker. Could there be another explanation? Could it be that the staff member was a problem? So we, we look at something and we instantly, again, jump to a conclusion. Um, maybe, uh, it's easy to attribute this person's behavior to his personality, but maybe it's a an actual medical problem. You know, maybe the person is angry and screaming and hollering because they have a brain injury, they're on drugs, they had uh, a diabetic reaction, they're having a stroke. Uh, so, what are the other potential options? And that helps us. But weighing those other potential options helps us say, well, if it was this, we better go find out if the patient has this, that, and the other. Uh, commission bias. So this means EMS providers can sometimes have a hard time not initiating a treatment. Um, so it's difficult to realize some, sometimes that uh, the less one does, the better. And I've learned this in my over two decades, that sometimes less is more. Um, we don't always have to start an IV on somebody. Sometimes starting an IV on somebody is actually going to make the whole situation much worse. So as long as you can defend your actions in most cases, your medical director and your service will probably go to bat for you. Um, sometimes we over-treat patients uh, just because we feel better to, to have been able to do something. Maybe it was something uh, that we, had, we couldn't do anything about anyway. So narcotic antagonists, here's a great one, such as Narcan or Naloxone. You can give this as, as an AEMT. And sometimes people say, oh, well, let, let's give them the whole thing. Give them two milligrams. We're just going to give them two milligrams of Narcan. Um, well, we know that people who, are, who need Narcan have narcotics in their system. Maybe they have narcotics in their system for a reason because they paid a bunch of money on the street for their heroin. And now you wake them up and they're not happy. And things get real ugly real quickly for you. So that's why we say let's give it in, in, a, in a gentle uh, gradual process. We give them a little bit, see if their respirations improve, um, because if we wake them the whole way up or if we put them into withdrawal, things get ugly. We may also have an omission error where we forgot to do something. Um, we hesitated to do it. We didn't ask. So instead of placing a mask over the patient's, uh, over the face of a conscious patient in severe respiratory distress, uh, but they didn't want to do it because they're like, oh, they're not that bad, they're not that bad, yet the patient becomes hypo, uh, hypoxic and, and dies. And then we also have anchoring. Anchoring that pitfall was that one piece of information revealed early, and we grab onto it and we're like, this is it, this is it, this is it. Um, and basically we, again, jumped to a conclusion and said this is the one thing. 
it's got to be this, it's got to be, it's got to be, it's got to be. But could it be from something else? There's potentially a lot of other things that it could, could be. So avoid your pitfalls. Reflect on your own thinking process. So how is it that I got to this conclusion? So stop and think and say, okay, this is what I think it is, but why is it that I truly think that? Share your thought processes. Talk to your coworkers. Talk to um, talk to other medical professionals. Maybe you drop off a patient later in the day. You go back and and uh, drop off another patient. Talk to that nurse or that doctor that was there and say, "Here's where we got to that. What ended up happening?" And in most cases, they'll be happy to give you some feedback on their outcome. And then you can you can also chat with them and say, "Well, here's why we went the route we did." What could we have done differently? And that's a that's a very powerful statement, uh, or a very powerful question to ask somebody is is what could we have done different? Uh, get that feedback. Most hospitals are very good about giving you some feedback. They may not give you tons and tons of info, but most of them will give you something. And then read case studies, read journal articles, go go to continuing education classes, refresher courses, and whatnot. That's the stuff that helps you polish up. Those are the things that help you see the little extra tidbits that you perhaps were missing. Okay. So many components of the assessment treatment and preparation for transport have to occur simultaneously. You've got to know those different components. You need to be able to bounce around. If you can only work in a linear fashion, you are not going to do well. Luckily, in EMS, many cases, we have extra pet sets of hands. Somebody can be working on treatment, somebody can be working on assessment, somebody can be working on transport. So we have a lot of uh, potential benefit here. Engage in teamwork. Use your team to your advantage. You are not the only one. Um, you are not, it's not your ambulance, it is not your call. It is everybody's call. You just might be the person that's in charge this time. But remember, sometimes the best leaders are the ones that stand back and let the other people uh, make the process, make the progress. You're not, you shouldn't have to, to pull them along, um, but uh, to be down there in the trenches working with them, it, that's the best, best team leader. And then prioritize scene safety, management of the ABCs. That's always critical. Priority on scene safety and ABC management. Uh, you can't hardly go wrong there. All right. 